right. So turn on the mic. Ooh, somebody turn the uh, turn the amplifier all the way up. I caught that. C C C C C. Okay, I think that's a, that's about right. Not too bad. Not too not too loud. <coughs> All right. Well, you got your seats. Are you guys ready? <laughs> okay. All right. So, are there any questions from the from this class about the homework assignment, which is due next Tuesday? So, the homework assignment, you know, it's called a tale of two functions, and the whole idea is to implement the the functions, you know, G, uh, f and also f uh, f inverse uh, using C plus plus. So are there any questions? Yep, go ahead. So if we compile our code on Copa, how do we do the uh, passing that we did? OK, so if you compile the code in Coblox, you will still you should still be able to find the executable in the folder. So what you do is you run the executable inside a CMD or command line interface in Windows. You should still be able to use the redirect symbol. OK? OK. All right, so um, any other questions? Yes? You can do it in C as well, but then your ex the extension of the file should still be CPP. Because C++ is backward compatible with most things, so you can do it in C. So I'm taking this you know, as you want to use a printf and scanf you know, to do the input and output. OK, yeah, that should work. You just have to pound include uh, STDIO instead of uh, IO stream. Okay. Any other questions about the homework assignment? Alrighty. Okay. So are you are you guys ready? Okay. So let's let's focus on on, on what we're going to talk about today. So if you have any questions about the homework assignment or functions or stuff like that, you know, just go ahead and ask me. But if there are no questions about that, I am mo moving forward to talk about um, the next big topic, which is propositional logic. Okay? So propositional logic is an interesting um, topic because it is actually of practical value in computer science, um, even though it's did not start off as a computer computer science specific um, area of study because the you know, logic is just logic, right? It doesn't even have to apply to computer science. This has turned into something that is really quite interesting and uh, really relevant to computer science. So here's a little link to the history of propositional logic, uh, which is actually not my own writing. Okay, this is you know, from somebody else's website. So you can go ahead and read this, but it's not, for the most part, it is not uh, directly applicable to our class. So it's, it gives you some background, but I'm not going to quiz you on anything like that. Um, propositional logic is all about proving something, okay? In other words, you know, if you are given a set of axioms, okay, a, a set of truths, okay, things that are known to be true, okay, how do you use, how do you use logic to prove that something else <coughs> is also true as a result of those things that are given that is true. Okay, how many? Well, you guys have all taken see a math three seventy or a class that is equivalent to math three seventy, right? So many of your math classes would involve would involve your proofs, mathematical proofs. What is a mathematical proof in those classes? So we are not talking about the proof in this class. But the proof of the regular math. What, what does it what does it involve? Sorry? Okay, so you give the theorem to prove, right? You know, whatever you're you're proving is called a theorem, even though sometimes you know, we have other names for smaller, less significant theorems, but nonetheless, for the purpose of this discussion, the proposed um, condition is a theorem, okay? Because it can be true, it can be false, and you have to prove that it is true all the time, okay? That makes it a theorem. But what you're given with sometimes is implicit, okay? So a lot of times when you're dealing with algebra, the, the axioms in algebra are basically assumed. 
So you have the com commutative rule, you have the associative rule, you have all kinds of rules that you can use to manipulate you know, the expressions until you can get to the final form where you know, it is the end. That's basically what you need to do. Okay. And in the previous <coughs> class, you know, uh, remember the my graduate school story? So you know, that basically shows you the importance of actually going through a rigorous proof for any theorem that you're going to depend on. Okay? You, know, you cannot, you know, I, I would not just you know, spot check a few things and say, oh, th it works out for this number, it works out for that number. This, this general you know, statement has to be true for all numbers. Okay? That just doesn't jive with you know, my, just doesn't work with me. <coughs> So a, a proof is basically a step-by-step -step sequence, in this case, to link axioms and statements using transformation rules until the conclusion of what you need to prove you know, has been reached. And this is not, uh, a proof is not creating anything new because, you know, it's, if what you're, pro what you're trying to prove is true to begin with, your proof is really the discovery of a path from all the given axioms, all the given truths, to the statement that you need to prove to be true. Okay? Ooh, it's really raining outside. <laughs> I can hear it, you know, just as soon as the door opened, you know, I can hear it from here. So that's really kind of some rain. All right. So before we can actually do any types of proofs, we'll go ahead and revisit some of the basic operators. I don't think, you know, they are really, you know, uh, we need to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we have conjunction, but this time I'm looking at conjunction not as an operator, and you can probably recognize these symbols. They are <coughs> symbols that we make use of when we talk about functions, okay? So in other words, I look at conjunction, which is you know, this symbol here, to basically map something from this as the domain to this as the codomain, which makes sense, right? Because you know, a conjunction has two sides, which means it has two critical parameters, um, the first zero one represents the first parameter or whatever is to the left hand side of your conjunction. This is representing whatever is to the right hand side of the conjunction operator. Um, it's just a way of writing things. You know, we just like the infix notation for the most part, but you can look at it as a function. And this is the return type, okay, of um, conjunction. It is always returning a boolean, which is you know, a zero and a one in this class because I. I just don't want to type out your know, true false. I just use a zero and one instead. But the function itself is defined as a set, just like you know when we talk about functions in the previous section, we talk about you know, how a function is mapping something, an element in the domain to something in the codomain. And this is doing exactly that. In other words, zero, zero as a two tuple is an element of the domain, but when you have zero and zero, or false and false, the answer is false, and this is the element in the codomain. In other words, I'm just you know, reusing some of the terms that we have already talked about in the previous topic to kind of look at conjunction, disjunction, and negation as functions. Are there any questions about these three definitions of conjunction, disjunction, and negation? Okay, no questions? Okay. So we, we can use a truth table to define all of these operators, but we can also use a form like this you know, as a function to define all of, all of these things. We also talked about how we use implication in this class. A implies B is basically exactly the same thing as saying not A or B. Okay. So this is something that we have also kind of talked about quite a few times already. <clears throat> and this is the function view of implication. So when you look at implication itself as a function, it is taking two parameters. The first parameter is Boolean, the second parameter is Boolean, and then the return type is Boolean as well. And this is representing exactly how we map all the possible cases of the parameters to all the, po to the corresponding result resulting values. Okay. In other words, we are looking at implications not as a truth table, but rather as a function like this. Yep, go ahead. Could you walk through that? Uh, <coughs> the right side is equal sign. I'm not quite understanding how it's exactly the same as the You mean this equal sign? Yeah, to the right of that. To the right of that. Oh, is that if you have uh, 
zero implies okay false implies false is true that's th this particular element in the function states that false implies false is true this one is saying false implies true is true because false implies whatever is true the only time you get a false is when you have true implies false then you have the implication itself as false and then the last one is true implies true and that is true as well the implication itself is true <coughs> is that helping is that okay all right okay and then the last one is equivalence we talked about that too equivalence is basically going in both directions it's implication going in both directions so when you look at the uh, members in this particular set it is just a little bit different because we have two items being false so these two items are both false when it comes to equivalence which is represented by a double-sided arrow um, but otherwise you know it is basically the same as implication it's just that you, it, it has to go in both directions are there any questions about these uh, operators because we're going to use these operators quite a bit in the next uh, probably two classes or so no questions it's okay all right okay so now we get into propositional calculus, which is a pretty long slide and it is a little bit difficult to read because it is kind of abstract, okay? A lot of concepts in mathematics and logic are abstract because we are basically getting rid of all the details that really do not, does not you know, have anything to do with the, the core subject matter itself. So in this case, you know, propositional <coughs> calculus is abstracted to a four tuple. Okay, so I'm skipping a whole bunch of stuff here. We're skipping all the way to use this representation to basically say, okay, what are we talking about when we talk about propositional logic? There are four major components to propositional logic or a propositional calculus system. The first one is alpha. It looks like uppercase A, but it is actually uppercase alpha. So the alpha is basically defining a set of symbols to be used in the system. And that's exactly what it is, okay? It is equivalent to what letters you know can you use in a C++ program as an identifier that's basically what it is okay so in a C++ program or Java program you can use uppercase A to Z lowercase A to Z the underscore and all of those and also 0 to 9 as long as it is not the first letter but when you look at the individual characters okay um, it's uppercase A to Z lowercase A to Z the underscore 0 to 9 that is your alpha is the most basic building block of your of your logic system. But we also include you know what we know as quote unquote constants. Okay, so zero and one you know in a truth system would also be included in alpha because those are also the very basic symbols that you use um, to express you know values. And then there's one more thing that doesn't really map anything map to anything that we have to deal with in programming. It is called a schemata. Okay, so we'll talk about what a schemata is later on, because a schemata is basically a symbol that can represent a quote unquote well-formed formula. Now, what is a well-formed formula? Well, we can't talk about that just yet. Okay, because we have to talk about the omega set or operators first. <clears throat> but basically, if you can look at the alpha set as all the basic symbols that you can use in a propositional calculus system. Is that okay so far? Okay. All right. So we look at omega is next. Okay, omega, this is uppercase omega. Omega is a set of what we call connectives, okay, which is just a really, you know, the same thing as an operator, okay? So a connective is the same thing as an operator. A, an operator is really important because this is what, how you can connect things together. You can connect the symbols that we have defined in alpha using operators or using connectives. Um, and then, when you, and then depending on the definition, some people also like to break the omega set itself into the smaller omegas. So you have omega one being ome uh, all the operators that only have one single operand. Like negation is you know, going to be in omega one because it only has one single operand, and then you have omega two. Most of our logical operators will fall into omega two because conjunction needs two things, um, disjunction needs two things, 
implication needs two things, and then equivalence also needs two things. So most of the operators that we know of, you know, will fall into omega two, with the exception of negation, which is falling into omega one. But most of the time, we don't even differentiate. We just say, okay, what are our operators? It's just omega. Is that okay? Yes. Basically, they're inter interchangeable, you know, in this in this in this context. So, could any function be an omega? If you if you want to, yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> it's really a matter of notation because you know we normally write an operator using the infix notation, right? So, if, I'm just going to use a whiteboard because this is not really that important or related to uh, the course material. So we typically use um, the index notation like this, okay, times let's say the variable x, and then the whole thing divided by y, and so on. Now this is a, a really typical example of using the infix notation because the operator is between the two things that it is supposed to operate on, right? Okay, the plus operator <coughs> is between the five and the four to mean that I want to add five and four. Okay, what are we doing with the sum? Well, okay, we have to use parentheses to indicate the priority of operation here because I want to use the sum of five and four and multiply it to x first. That's the second operation, the multiplication. And then what do we do with the product? Well, we want to divide it by y, and that's basically the division, or in this case, I use the fractional you know, symbol to represent exactly the same thing. So this is what we call the infix notation because the operator is between the things that it is supposed to operate on. And you don't feel this is odd because you have been taught this since what? Elementary school, since second grade, since the first time you see the plus operator. That's why it doesn't look odd to us, okay? But instead of doing it this way, I can turn it into something that, be, that is the prefix notation. So the prefix notation means the operation, or you specify the operation first, then you, t then you say what you're operating on. So in this case, you know, we have a plus operating on five and four, okay? And this becomes one of the things that we want to operate with x using the multiplication, like so. And then the, the product itself is involving in, being involved in the division, and y is the second component of the division. So the division is gonna be the last or outermost operation. So this is called a prefix notation, where you specify what you are going to do first, and then you specify the, all the components that you need in order to carry out that operation. Have we seen prefix notation? Function calls. Function calls, exactly. Every single time you use a function in C and C++, it is using the prefix, with only the exception of overloading operators then you're using the infix notation for those things. But because you can overload operators, how do you overload operators? Or I should ask, okay, let me, let me change the question a little bit. What is the main difference between an overloaded operator as opposed to a normal function in C and C++? Does it change how it works, or does it only change how it is represented in syntax? It's only changing the representation in syntax, okay? Everything that you do in a regular function, you can do it with an overloaded operator as well. So that means, you know, off overloaded operators <coughs> are not really that special. It's really just for notation purposes that we normally look at equal, equal to say, oh, are the right, is the right-hand side equal to the uh, left-hand side, okay? So we preserve that meaning when we overload that operator equal, equal to deal with classes so that we can also establish whether two objects are considered equivalent or not. But you can define equal equal to do anything, okay? It doesn't have to be reflecting equality. It doesn't have to return a Boolean, right? You can overload it to do whatever you want it to, to do. Like, you know, <coughs> just going back to the homework assignment. This is the right shift operator. This is the left shift operator. <coughs> it has nothing to do with file operation. But when you define your know, C in or C out or IO streams, they overload these operators to basically mean are we inputting something or are we outputting something, okay? So that means that it really got, kind of goes back to the infix versus the prefix notation. It really is just a way of looking at things. It doesn't really change what we're doing. 
But that really goes to your question, because you can define any type of Boolean function and add it to omega, even something that would involve like four operands, okay? It just, it would just be totally inconvenient to use the infix notation, then you have, you're, you're basically forced to use the prefix notation. But yes, you can. We don't have any problems with that. But since we have talked about in, if we talked about pre, there has to be one more of these things. Post. Post, exactly. Postfix notation. So the postfix notation is actually my favorite. Of all the notations, postfix is, I think, the superior, the only one that people should be taught. <laughs> okay? Okay, so what does it mean? Okay, postfix notation means you specify the things first and then you, t and then you say what to do with them. Okay, for instance, five plus four. You don't say five plus four or plus five four. You say five, four, plus. You push a five, you push a four, and then you say pop those two things, add them up, and then push the sum back onto the stack. What about you know, multiply, multiplication with x? Then you specify x, you push x on the stack. Now you have two things on the stack, which is the sum and x. Then you say, oh, let's multiply those two. And then you push the product back onto the stack. And then you say, what do we do with the product? Oh, let's divide it by y. So you push y at this point, and then you say divide. See how concise this is? See how we don't need parentheses? <coughs> and that is the, that's the reason why I think this really should happen the way we, taught, we were taught how to do expressions in arithmetic, not the cumbersome infix notation, because we are forced to remember that we have to perform multiplication first before addition when there are no parentheses. There are all of these you know, kind of special you know, silly rules that we have to use in order to use infix notation, but in postfix notation, we don't have to do that at all. Yep? Does there need to be spaces or commas between the characters in postfix? In postfix, it depends on how it is represented. If this is a calculator, they typically have an enter key. So you say 5 enter, 4 enter, plus x enter, or whatever x is representing, multiply, which is a key, y enter, and then divide, which is a key. Okay. And so you, you never have to press the equal button. There's no such thing as an equal button. There are no parentheses either. Okay. So this is called the postfix notation, which is also actually used. Okay? So for anyone who wants to look into PDFs, okay, portable document format, inside PDF are basically a whole bunch of you know, these postfix notations, because PDF is actually a programming language. Believe it or not, okay, it is actually a programming language, so that you know the uh, the language itself can specify how things are drawn on screen, and that's why PDF documents can print on a 300 DPI printer, 600 DPI printer, 1200 DPI printer, all equally well, because it is not actually representing the individual dots, it is actually telling the printer how to draw all those little characters, all those letters. Is that okay? And there's also before PDF, there's also a printer quote unquote language called PostScript. And guess why it is called PostScript, right? So PostScript is actually done by the same company, you know, uh, the, the one company that we know as Adobe these days, okay? It's actually responsible for PostScript, which, what, which have been in its existence for a long, long time, okay? Pretty much ever since laser printers were you know, conceived, okay? So that has been around for a long time. And PDF is kind of like the next generation of uh, PostScript. So PDF also has to deal with uh, user interaction, like fields and stuff like that. So it, 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 they added far more uh, scripting capability to PDF. And that's also why you get you know, like weekly updates of your PDF reader, because it is actually complex. Okay? A PDF document is a program which is a problem because now people can try to exploit the PDF reader okay, to gain you know, unauthorized access to computers. If it is really just rendering something, like a, rendering a graphics file or something like that, that would pose very little you know, security concern. A PDF really is a programming language, even though it is disguised as you know, a, a document format. <coughs> okay. 
And there are calculators, by the way, that can understand postfix notation, or you know, it is better known as RPN when it comes to calculators, which stands for reversed Polish notation. Um, if you have a parent, I'm just thinking whether your parent would be old enough. I think many of your parents will be still too young to remember RPN. Okay, so if you ask someone who's a little bit older than your parent, okay, uh, someone who used to be an engineer, okay, doesn't have to doesn't have to be any particular engineer, civil engineer, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, and so on. Just ask them about the HP calculators that they used in the past. They all use RPN. <coughs> So older engineers can do translations like this into RPN just like that, because that's what they need to do. So anyway, but they all represent the same thing. This is the infix notation of this particular equation. This is the prefix notation. This is the postfix notation, but they mean exactly the same thing. Okay? Are there any questions about the notations? Kind of like this, if this is a small digression from um, propositional logic. In a way, it's kind of connected, because the next topic that we're going to talk about is WFF, which is not WTF, <coughs> is well-formed formula, okay? Well-formed formula is defined recursively, okay? So we'll take a look at you know, the recursive definition. Each element in A is automatically a well-formed formula. In other words, Anything that is representing a constant is automatically a well-formed formula. Anything that's representing a variable is automatically a well-formed formula. Anything that is representing a quote-unquote schemata is also automatically a well-formed formula. So this is forming the basis of all of the larger well-formed formula that we can, um, we can construct. So right here, okay, this is a kind of awkward way to say that, but it is you know, basically what it is. Um, for every for every i between one and n, the following is going to be a well-formed formula. Okay, so we are basically looking at um, this is phi. Okay, so we are looking at phi i. If phi i is a well-formed formula itself, and omega is in omega n, which means omega needs n arguments, then we can claim that omega. And so this is definitely using the prefix notation. So omega as a connective, and then we have phi i all the way up to phi n as its arguments. This becomes a well-formed formula. It is a recursive definition. Now, when we look at the actual symbols that we are going to use, it's a lot easier to remember. Okay, it's a lot easier to understand. So we basically say, oh, is this in alpha? Probably it should be in alpha because it's representing a constant, okay? Is this in alpha? Okay, you know, we'll go back and talk about that next. You know, there are examples uh, next to this one. So P, Q, R are usually used to represent variables, okay? Which is a part of alpha. This is a well-formed formula. This is a well-formed formula. Um, how many things do we need to make a conjunction work? Exactly two things, right? So that means, you know, zero and P is automatically a well-formed formula, okay? Same thing goes with uh, disjunction, okay? So P, so we have Q, which is usually in alpha, R is usually in alpha, so by themselves, they are well-formed formula, well-formed formulae to begin with. And then we can say, oh, what about OR? How many things do, do, does OR need in order to operate? Two things, so we can say, oh, that makes Q or R um, a well-formed formula. So now we have one kind of big well-formed formula here, another one over here, and then we say, oh, look at this operator here, this connective implication. How many things does it need? Two things. Oh, I can plug this one over here, plug that one over there, and now we have an even bigger you know, well-formed formula. I can take this implication and use it somewhere else. So if you, as you can see, if this is just basically a recursive definition of what a well-formed formula is so that it is, you can recursively apply this and construct a bigger and bigger uh, formulae. Is that making any sense? Sort of? Okay. Yep. How did you prove the variables were well formed? So you say again? How, how did you show the variables were well formed? Was it just like because they're in the variables? Because they are in alpha. Okay. Because they're in alpha. 
So when we, when we scroll down to the example, okay, um, alpha typically has you know, some Greek symbols. So in this case, we have phi, we have psi, and then we have rho. So tho those are typically representing um, what we call schemata. Okay? <coughs> and then we have the usual English letters, uh, P, Q, R, S, T, in this form, and also including U. So these are usually used to represent what we call variables. And then we have 0, 1, which is what we use to represent the constants in Boolean logic. <clears throat> but those, all of those, are basically in alpha itself. Okay, every single one of these are in is in alpha. Are there any questions about this part? Yep. So, do you define alpha to contain what you need? Yes. Okay. So you can define alpha to include, you know, more letters if you need to. <clears throat> So in this case, you know, we have omega 1 only containing one single element, which is the negation symbol, because negation is the only unary operator that we use in logic. And then omega 2 has the most, you know, all, all, most of the other operators, because it has conjunction, disjunction, implication, and also equivalence. These are the binary operators or binary connectives <coughs> that we usually use. So that's a very typical example of propositional logic calculus system where we use you know, some Greek letters to mean schemata, we use some um, English letters to mean variables, and then we have zero and one to designate false and true. Is that okay so far? Okay. So the rest of this is really just explaining, okay, you know, how we can construct the well-formed formula. So one thing is, is definitely not a well-formed formula is when you have a conjunction, but you only supply one value to it. This is not well-formed because you have a connective that requires two things, but you only supply one thing to it. So it's not a well-formed formula. Okay. <coughs> or you can say, oh, what about the PQ? Okay. Well, because I'm not using the shorthand, the you know, PQ means P and Q in this class. So make sure you don't confuse this class with CISP 310 where we use you know, PQ to mean P and Q. But in this class, you know, there's no connective between these two and it is not well formed in this class. So are we doing okay so far? Okay. And the negation is only requiring one thing because it's a unit operator. So when you have you know, zero, negate, you know, Q, this is not well formed either because you're supplying two things to a, a connective that only requires one thing. Okay. <clears throat> so it's basically syntax, okay? The way we construct well-formed formula could corresponds to the syntax of a programming language. Whereas, you know, alpha is corresponding to, okay, what can I use as identifiers? That's basically what alpha is doing. Now, iota is important. Iota is important because it tells you everything that is true to begin with. Okay, so iota is basically a set of well-formed formulae that are known to be true. Don't ask me why it is true, just that it is true to begin with. So in this case, you know, we have a few things. Uh, true is known to be true to begin with. Um, we say not false is true to begin with. I cannot say anything that's false but I can say anything that is false and then just negate it because the negation of false is true. And that's why we have this thing here too because zero and zero has a value of false but I cannot say it is false because the iota consists of well-formed formulae that are known to be true. Well, how can I turn something that is false into something that's true? Well, just negate it. And that's why you know, we have the negation of zero and zero, the negation of zero and one, and the negation of one and zero, but this one I don't need to negate because one and one is true. So we have all of these things you know, put into the iota set, which basically means, okay, these things are known to be true. <coughs> now, in a particular calculus system, it would also include some variables. Okay, it will also include some variables or some of the uh, for some formulae involving variables. In other words, in this particular case, later on we can see some examples. So in this case, the iota may include something like this. It may include p implies q. It is it is stating a relationship between p and q uh, that has to be true. So p implies q is known to be true all the time. Does that mean p is always true? No. 
know, does it mean, does it mean Q is true all the time? No, it simply means that P implies Q is always true. If P is false, then Q can be anything. But if P is one, then Q has to be one. Is that okay? All right, you can state something like this. Okay, you can say P or R, okay? P or R simply means that, well, we don't know whether P is true or not, we don't know whether R is true or not, but at least one of these two has to be true, because that's what you need in order for the disjunction to be true. So iota can include these um, uh, well-formed form formulae as well. In addition to the axioms, it can also include something that is specific to this particular calculus system. Is that okay? <clears throat> okay. So I'll give you some examples later on because you know it. Well, actually, I do right here. Okay. So in addition to axiomatic definitions, which are basically all of these things, these are axiomatic. I also include specific facts which, from which logical conclusions can be drawn. So I can basically associate a particular meaning to P. Me, uh, P means you know tech drinks coffee. Okay, which can be true, it can be false. Today it is false, I did not drink coffee. So you can probably tell whether I lecture differently today or not, because I think that some people said that caffeine has a pretty significant effect on me. <laughs> so without coffee, I probably would go a little bit slower than usual. And we'll use Q to represent tech is sleepy. And we'll use R to represent T has more work to do. P, Q, and R, they are all variables. In other words, each one of these can be true and it can, it can be false, okay? Does the tech drink coffee today? It's something that can be true, can be false, okay? Am I sleepy? Can be true, can be false. And do I have more work to do? Can be true, can be false. So P, Q, and R are variables because each one can be true, can be false as well. But I can include this into iota. This is a well-formed formula. I know this is a well-formed formula because starting from the bottom, I know P is a well-formed formula to begin with. I know Q and R, each, each one is a well-formed formula. I know Q and R is well-formed because conjunction needs two things and Q and R are both well-formed formula. As a result, when you connect those two well-formed formulae using a conjunction, the result itself is also well-formed. And we can also say that P is equivalent to Q and R is also well formed because equivalence, okay, the double sided arrow, needs two things. It needs two well formed formulae as its components. P is a well formed formula as a component. Q and R is a well formed formula as a component. And as a result, this entire thing is a well formed formula. What is it really saying? Well, if this is in iota, it means tech drinks coffee if and only if tech is sleeping and tech has more work to do. That's what it's saying. Does it mean that I, I, I'm drinking coffee all the time? No. If I don't have more work to do, I'm not going to drink coffee, even if I'm sleeping. Does that make any sense? So the, the so this well-formed formula, even though it, the, the formula itself is always true, it doesn't tell you anything about the individual variables, whether it has to be true or whether it has to be false. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so the question is whether the logic system can deduce based on the facts that, you know, um, if I'm not if I did not drink coffee, can we imply that um, I do not have more work to do? Okay, that is remaining, that is, that is left to be done, you know, it's just a question. Okay. Um, iota can also include specific facts, just as, uh, such as Q. So if Q itself is inside iota, it means in this case, tech is sleepy is true. Because everything, every well-formed formula in IOTA is known to be true. So if Q itself is in IOTA, it means that is also true. All right, next thing, Zeta. Okay, Zeta is, yes? So for IOTA, um, so if you have a fact, um, so like since you're saying like tech can be sleeping and tech can not sleeping, mm -hmm. so both the fact and the negation of the fact within IOTA are all both true? Say that one more time. 
Okay, because um, you have, so the facts and iota are separated from the logical formulas, but the corrector, are they always linked to a specific formula? Everything that is known to be true always is in iota. The, if, the, it, it is the basis of everything. Okay, but so I guess the thing that hangs me up is that you mentioned that there's some instances where attack is not sleeping, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so the negation of that would also potentially, so, okay, so with the facts, you have situations where the facts are false, um, but their negations are also situationally true. So would both the fact and the negation of the fact be they cannot both be in iota because everything in iota are connected by conjunction. In other words, the iota is basically saying true is true, not false is true, and not false is true, and not false and false is true, and not false and true is true, and blah, blah, blah. And then when you connect it to the rest here, it is also saying and the tech is drinking coffee is equivalent to tech is sleepy and tech has more work to do is also true. So all of these things are connected by conjunction implicitly. You cannot have P and not P all both in IOTA because then it would be contradiction. Okay, so you have to have a formula defining the facts in IOTA so that they maintain the truth though. You have to you have to have a formula associated with the facts. You can't just have like unique you couldn't just have P with an IOTA, you have to have that formula. You can have P in iota, but that's only if you know for sure that P is true all the time. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, you can only say, you know, you can express how the individual conditions relate to each other, such as, you know, P is equivalent to Q and R, okay? It is just relating the three variables, okay? It is stating that relationship is always true, but it doesn't say anything about P is always true, Q is always true, or R is always true. Yep. So in proof, <coughs> these are basically the theorems and what's given? Or the assumptions? What is given? What the assumptions, correct. Okay. Yep. These are the assumptions, these are the givens, and they're always true. All right. So how do we get from stuff in the IOTA to the theorem that you actually want to prove? The theorem that you want to prove is basically another well-formed formula. So how do you go from a set of well-formed formulae in the IOTA set that are known to be true, given to be true, do not ask why it is true, to the theorem, which doesn't seem to connect to anything of, of like that, and say that, oh, that has to be true as well because you know, of IOTA. So the Zeta, the Zeta set is basically that. It, it, consists of a, uh, it consists of a set of transformation rules. Okay, so these are basically transformation rules where you can take some, if not all, of the things that are known to be true at this point, and then you say, oh, I can see that you know, this, this, and this matches this pattern of this particular rule, and as a result, I can apply this rule and end up with another well-formed formula that is also known to be true. Is that okay? It's transformation, okay? And the general form of this is it looks kind of like this. Each rule in Zeta looks like this. The left-hand side, which is a set of um, what we call schematas, okay? So in this case, psi one, psi two, and so on, it, they, each one is a well-formed formula, okay? It is not a variable. This is why I did not use P, Q, or R, S, T here, because P, Q, R, S, T are called variables. They can be true or false, but they cannot represent well-formed formulae in general. The Greek letters, on the other hand, can, okay? So psi one, psi two, psi three, they are basically, each one is a well-formed formula, okay? And then the uh, symbol that looks like a T rotated uh, counterclockwise 90 degrees, this one here, is called, there's a way to call that, inverse, okay? So this is inverse. And then in this case, you know, this is phi, so phi is another well-formed formula that is the result of connecting you know, uh, psi one, uh, phi one, psi one, psi two, and so on. Okay, okay. so it's, this is a good time to kind of skip forward a little bit to look at some of the rules that we know to be true in conventional logic. So in this case, you know, we have something that looks like this. Okay, now this one is awfully confusing, but it is a transformation rule, it makes sense. What does that mean? There's no left-hand side. 
Well, if you do not see anything in the left hand side, it means it's an empty set. You do not need anything to basically say, you know what, I can take any well form formula and then say that that well form formula or the negation of that well form formula is always true. Duh. Okay? In other words, you can generate stuff in the well form formula system. You can take anything that is known to be a well form formula. Okay, you can say, oh, zero is a well-form formula, right? And then you can take this and, and use this to plug this into the position of psi, and then you can say, oh, this or that is always true, this well-form formula is always true. Then you throw it into the pool of well-form formula that you're working on, the working set, no problem, okay? Is it meaningful? probably not particularly meaningful in this case, okay? But you can, you can throw anything into the system. You can say, I have no idea what P is representing. I have no idea what Q is representing. But this looks like a well-formed formula to me. So you, you put P and Q into Psi, and then you can say, oh, if Psi is P and Q, then we can take this and then say, or the negation of the same thing. That is always true. Throw this into the big pool of well-formed formulae known to be true at this point. Throw that in. So you can infinitely expand the number of well-formed formulae known to be true by doing some stuff like this. Is it meaningful? Does it really help you to, to prove the theorem that you want to prove? Probably not, okay? But keep that in mind, okay? Keep that thought in mind that some of these transformation rules are not necessarily useful. You can apply these things all day long. It is not wrong to apply it. It just doesn't help you to prove the theorem that you're supposed to prove. Let's take a look at the next one. The next one is equally pointless. Okay, or well, so it seems. Okay, you know, they actually, they always have their place and otherwise we wouldn't say here. Yep. It means inverse. Inverse, I N F E R, inverse, which is not implies. Okay, there, there's a big, huge difference between inverse and implies. Infer is a syntactic operation. Implies is a semantic operation. So one is one has to do with the meaning of stuff. The other one only has to do with the syntax of stuff. So all of these transformation rules are syntactical transformation. They do not really care much about the meaning of stuff. The meaning of stuff is all contained in IOTA itself. So these are all just syntactic, okay? Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Next, the next one seems to be a little bit more productive. So the next one basically say, if you, of all the well-formed formulae known to be true at this point, so that would include everything in the IOTA set and everything that you can generate using these transformation rules, okay? So you look at that huge, gigantic set, gigantic set of all the well-formed formulae that is known to be true, and you, look, you notice a pattern, okay? So you notice that, hey, I got P on one side, you know, that is in the set of all the well-formed formulae known to be true, and then you also see that your P implies R is also in that whole set of all the well-formed formulae known to be true at this point. Then you say, ah, I can apply that transformation rules. Transformation rule, because if I instantiate psi with P, uh, this is phi, I, if I instantiate phi with P, and I instantiate uh, psi with R, then this pattern match, okay? Is that okay? So, so it's all about pattern matching, okay? You're matching the pattern and say, hey, I can find this, I can find this, these two will match the prerequisite to apply this inference rule. What is the big deal? Well, the big deal is then you can infer, okay, and you can infer that R is also true by itself. So then you can throw R into the gigantic pool of all the well-formed formulae known to be true at that point. But this one is actually important, okay? This one is very important because um, it is actually how we do most of the proofs, okay? It's by implication, so that is important. But it, are you guys start, starting to see what the transformation rules are really about? 
it's really just pattern matching, okay? It's, it's matching, can, do we see syntactically that we have something like this and something like this in the big gigantic pool of local formulae? If you can find that pattern, then you can say, oh, let's go ahead and apply the transformation rule and then the, whatever the result of the transformation rule is saying is going to be in the big pool of well-formed formulae known to be true. So that's the result of the inference. <clears throat> is that okay? So when you look at a particular inference rule, this is the prerequisite. This is what you need to be true already in order to apply the inference in, and this is the result of the inference, which basically means you know, that well-formed formula is also guaranteed to be true as well, if you can match the pattern of the prerequisites. Is that okay? It's a pattern matching kind of thing. It's completely syntactic. Any questions? There are no questions. We're going to go through all of these. Um, this one is really useful. Okay, this is the basis of uh, proof by contradiction. Okay, if you can, if you can, if you find the implication itself. Okay, something implies something, and on, in, in this case, um, phi and psi, you know, they are schemata, so each one can represent any well-formed formula. Okay, but you you can also find the negation of psi in this case. So if you can find the negation of some well-formed formula, that well-formed formula turns out to be the consequence of an implication, then you can conclude that the precedent of the implication has to be false. It, once again, it is just pattern matching. Okay? You, you're just going through, you're digging through your big, huge drawer of all the well-formed formulae that you have already proven to be true, and you just look at those things and go like, hmm, let me, let me go through all the rules, okay, and see, you know, what thing I can do with all of these things in my drawer. So you look at those things and go like, oh, we got this, we got this. Do they fit in the prerequisite of these rules, you know, the, the structure of the rules, okay? If they do, then you apply the transformation rule, and then whatever the result of the rule is, you put it back into the drawer of all the well-formed formulas that don't be true. So you keep doing this, and hopefully until you find the well-formed formula that you're trying to prove. But you can keep going forever sometimes and not confirm whether the well-formed formula that you're supposed to prove is actually not a theorem or just that you haven't found it yet. That is a big problem of using this kind of inference rule is because some of these can generate rules, they can generate an infinite number of results, stuff like that, okay? And you can keep going and going and going. And yet you will, it's not productive, okay? So we'll go through a few more things, okay? Um, if you find two individual things in your drawer, because everything in the drawer are supposed to be true at exactly the same time, they're all supposed to be true, so you can pick up any two things from the drawer and say, hey, I can put a conjunction between these things, and the conjunction as a well-formed formula is also true, put it back into the drawer. And you can see how this by itself can already generate an infinite number of well-formed formulae that are useless and pointless. But it doesn't mean that they're all going to be useless, right? Sometimes it's going to be useful. And then we got the last one, okay? <clears throat> it's kind of the, it's a simplifi simplification rule. So in your drawer, if you can find that you know, one of these things in your drawer, the, the last operation is a conjunction, then you can say, oh, it fits the description of the prerequisite of applying this inference rule. And then what you do is you break up the conjunction, and you put one of the things back into the drawer. It's, it makes sense, right? If the conjunction is trust itself is true, then all the components making the conjunction have to be true as well. So it makes perfect sense. So this one is kind of deconstructing conjunctions to put it back into the drawer. Yep. You can also put back the, the first component when you get the second component. Well, because it's a, it, because the um, the well-formed formula are in a set, so you don't have quote unquote duplicate, you know, uh, well formed formulae. But some of these things can infinitely generate, you know, formulae, like P and P and P and P and P. You can keep going forever, right? It, it, it's, it's still saying the same thing as P, but, but you know, each one is a distinct 
um, formula, the well-formed formula, well-formed formula, because P and P is distinct from P and P and P as two different well-formed formulae. Now, to us, it means exactly the same thing because you look at the truth table and go like, hey, they are exactly the same thing. But remember, we're dealing with a syntactical system here. So if they look different, they are different. So you can generate you know, an infinite number of things that are truly just equivalent to one thing, and it doesn't help you a bit to get to the conclusion that you are looking for. <coughs> now some of these can go in both directions. So the ones that can go in both directions are like this, okay? So this one is, well, we know this one already. I mean, we have talked about this one quite a few times, but this time we're looking at this from the syntactic perspective. It basically means if you, if inside a drawer you find, you know, uh, a well-formed formula and we, we use the symbol uh, phi to represent the first one that we find, and then we use phi to represent another well-formed formula in the implication. You find the implication itself in the drawer, okay? Which is the right-hand side of this transformation rule. Then you can go back to the other direction and say, hey, I can transform this one into the negation of the first well-formed formula, disjunction with the second well-formed formula, okay, using the not and the or. Throw that back into the bin because you know, these are bi-directional. If you can, each one can be the prerequisite of the uh, result of that one. So this can serve as the pattern that you're matching so that this becomes the result or you can reverse it and say that this is the pattern that you are using to match the stuff that you already have and use this side as the result of the result the result of applying this particular inference. Is that okay? So they're basically still the same thing, they're still inference, it's just bi-directional in this case. <coughs> are we doing okay so far with all of this stuff? Okay? Why do you think I emphasize on syntactic operation? When you think of a proof in your math class, are you thinking about syntactic stuff in your head? No, because that's not how people operate, okay? We, only are, we are only concerned about syntactic stuff when we need to communicate with another person, okay? Because then we kind of have to agree to the same rules so that we can be understood. But when you're thinking about stuff, it is all about the meaning, the semantic of stuff, okay? It's not about syntactic stuff, right? Okay, what about computers? What does the compiler do? Okay, you guys all have taken CISP 360 and a few other classes, right? So you know what a compiler is. What does it do? It reads the source code. And it reads the source code, and then what does it do? It, it cranks out an executable that you can run, right? So, so this, the, the source code of C++ is completely meaningless to the Intel i5 processor. Okay, you, you present the source code to the i5 processor, the i5 processor will just kind of choke. Because it doesn't understand, you know, what, what do you mean by, you know, C out and C in, you know, it, it doesn't make sense at all to the processor. Okay, so your compiler is really doing a transformation of the C++ code into, eventually, into the assembly code or object code or op code that your i5, i7 processor can actually understand. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a translation process. But how does it translate that? Does, does your C++ compiler, quote unquote, understands what you intend to do? Or is it really just looking at the syntax of your stuff and go like, oh, here's a loop, this is the condition of the loop, this is the end of the loop, I better have a jump here all the way back to the beginning all the time, and then you know, when have a conditional branch to branch out of the loop, so it is, it's basically translating uh, <coughs> structure in one syntax to structure in another syntax into structure of another syntax and eventually end up with the actual opcode that your processor understand. Or do you think it goes in a different direction, like a person and go like, hey Tag, uh, what do you mean by this? Mm, oh I see, you want to do things in a repeated fashion. Okay, let me see how you know, I can translate that into something else. So do you think it's based on meaning or do you think it's just based on syntax? It's all based on syntax. Because that's the only thing computers know how to do things. It's all syntax, okay? And we kind of lose track of that aspect of computers because you know, computers have grown beyond, well, okay, they have become complex enough that 
we now start to see the illusion that computers actually understand meanings and stuff like that. Now, which is not to say that you know our own understanding of meanings is not an illusion itself. If you don't understand what I just said, it's okay. It's not a problem. If you do, you know, okay, that's 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 cool. <clears throat> okay, so this is a good time to. Um, Um, mutation theory. Okay, there we go. And I want to find some images of Turing's state machines and stuff like that. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> well, this is one, this is another one, and so on. Okay, so what I'm showing here is you know the, the work of Alan Turing. Okay, or some of the work that can be derived from Alan Turing's original work. Who's Alan Turing? Sorry? Yes. Yep. So he is one of the main characters in the movie, <laughs> the Imitation Game. Okay. So it's based on an actual person. Okay. It's based on an actual person. So he is also considered, you know, one of the most important you know, figures in computer science. Now, is why is he important? Because he worked with vacuum tube computers. No, he never really worked on the computers. <coughs> he worked on the theories behind those computers. What he worked on is the theory of computation in general. Now remember, his time is way before computers are Von Neumann machines. It's way, you know, meaning that you can store instructions in memory and stuff like that. It's way before apps, it's based on, it's way before Unix, it's way, way before C++, object-oriented programming, and all that stuff. So what he worked on is a theory and say that, you know, okay, computers are nothing more than a state machine. Okay, what is a state machine? A state machine can be in any state, okay? It has a finite number of choices of states. And it can go from one state to another state. Well, how do you go from one state to another state? You have an input symbol coming in okay, into the computer, which is one of part of the input, but kind of equivalent to you typing on the keyboard, okay? So depending on what is the input, the computer can make a transition to another state. But in the process of transitioning to another state, the computer can do certain things, can have actions. But those actions are very simple. It can either emit another symbol, it can store something into what it called a tape, or it can do nothing. Okay? So that's basically the most elemental model of a computer that Turing came up. Now, there are different, uh, different type of machines. You have finite state machines, where there's no storage whatsoever other than the state itself. Okay? So there, those are called FSM. Okay, finite state machines, which is also flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> but anyway, FSMs are important because it corresponds to regular expressions. Every regular expression that you can write can be recognized by a <coughs> finite state machine. So those two are hand in hand connected. The next one up will be finite state machines that is kind of souped up because it has got a stack. Those are called stack machines. So when you're making a transition, you can now say, hey, I can push something on the stack as the action re responding to the input. And as a part of the input, you can also say, well, let's see what is on the top of the stack. If the top of the stack is this thing, we can pop it and make a transition to another state. It doesn't seem to be a very vast improvement over the first one, but it is a big transition. Because every single compiler, every single computer programming language can be recognized by a push-down acceptor or push-down automator, which is also a push-down machine, which is basically a finite state machine with a stack. That is the theory behind um, syntax of all of the practical programming languages. And then when you say, oh, what if it doesn't have a stack which has a very specific order of putting things into it and retrieving things, last in, first out, right? What if it's a tape? So you can, you can go to any position to read and go to any other position to write. So this is random access. Well, that turns out to be what we call Turing machines. This is the most general and the most powerful class of computers in theory, okay? Doesn't sound like, you know, doesn't sound very powerful at all, right? <coughs> My i5 computer with eight gigs, 16 gigs of RAM and all kinds of you know, goodies has got to be more powerful than just that. Nope. 
not really. The tape machine in the computer, the Turing machine, is in theory more capable than any computer that we have because the tape is infinite. It's infinitely long. Okay? And then when you take into consideration that you have deterministic machines and non-deterministic machines, then you're talking about things, okay, deterministic means you can only be at one state at any particular time. That is deterministic. So DFSM, or deterministic finite state machine, they're fairly easy to understand. You're at any state at any particular time, depending on the <laughs> input, you make a transition to another state, and optionally you can output something in the transition, and so on and so forth, okay? I kind of lost my train of thought. A thought train wreck. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm trying to recover from the wreckage right now. Yep, BT, Ender. <laughs> the program just crashed when I got the sanitation fault, right? <clears throat> You're talking about deterministic state. Oh, non-deterministic, very good, okay. I should I should probably have a button somewhere on my recorder so I can do the, what, uh, what is that? Um, Timo, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you can do boop, 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 and just kind of go back a few seconds <laughs> each time. It is technically possible, I just have to write a script to do it. Um, so non-deterministic is, is even more powerful. Non-deterministic means from a single state, you can transition into two different states at the same time. So now your computer can be in multiple states at exactly the same time, which is equivalent to multi-processing or multi-threading, with only that one minor difference, that you have no limitation of how many cores you have. Okay, you can split into an infinite number of cores if you know, that is what the machine is specifying. So, you know, Alan Turing came up with all of these theories back in the late 40s and the early 50s. And today, it is still useful because he proved that there are certain problems in computer science that cannot be solved using even the most powerful class of computers. Okay, so even Turing computers, there is an entire class of problems that cannot be solved by even Turing machines. And that's before even we have all of these little complex, what we think are complex computers by today's standard. You know, if you look back in time, if, if someone were to transport you know, Alan Turing or give him a view of what we have today, he would totally be impressed by our technology. But he would also be impressed that his theory is still the foundation of computer science today. All of the new stuff that happened in the past, how long, 60, 50, 60 years, is all about technological advances. But it is very making, it's making very little <coughs> progress in terms of the foundational science of computer science. So, so when you get to a four-year university, many of you probably will have to take a class with a title of theory of computation or something along that line. And that class, you know, is, well, if you like this stuff, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be a really fun class. Okay, so now I have to go back to my original stuff. Okay, so now we have to talk about, you know, the soundness and completeness of propositional logic. Okay, so without going into all the symbols and stuff like that, you know, which is, well, there's a lot, quite, quite a few here, okay? <coughs> So the question is, okay, so one has to do with semantic entailment, okay, and the bottom line of semantic entailment is, okay, let me, let me find out you know, where the, okay, I don't have an actual summary of that. Semantically entails is basically using this symbol here. It looks just like infer, except it has got two bars instead of one. This means semantic entailment, okay? So, Semantic entailment is basically saying, okay, if you have a set of well-formed formula, okay, in this case I use you know phi one, phi two, all the way up to phi n, and if you say that you know, this set of well-formed formula is semantically entailing psi, which is another well-formed formula, it really means this. It means for every single tuple involved in a domain, okay, D is basically our domain here. The domain is 
Um, okay. The assumption is out of these well-form formulae, okay, out of phi 1, phi, a, phi 1, all the way up to phi n, and also psi. When you look at all of these well-formed formula, they are involving m variables, okay? So you can have, you can have um, these well-formed formulae, you're sharing your variables. One can say p and q, the other one can say r implies r, r implies q, and so on and so forth. So basically, you have n well-formed formulae on the left-hand side of semantic entailment, but they basically only make use of m variables in the process. So there are m variables involved in the process, and those are the variables of q1 all the way up to qm, okay? And d is basically a set of all the possible ways of generating tuples of q1 up to qm. So you're looking at 2 to the power of m possible arrangements. Is that okay? Yeah. F here is basically the same thing. Okay, F is defined up here. F is defined to be, you apply, you know, the parameters P1 all the, up to PM, and this is really just a conjunction of all the phi's. So phi1 all the up to phi n, you know, this is, I'm turning, I'm turning the conjunction of phi1 all the, up to, all the way up to phi n into function F. So f um, this function f has to imply you know, the result of function g involving exactly the same parameters. But this has to be true for every single possible ways of arranging those m variables in the process. If this implication is true all the time, then we have semantic entailment. Is that OK? Really OK? <laughs> Okay, let's, let's use an example. Okay, let me see if I have a, an example here. Mm, I, do, well, I do, yes, I do have an example. Okay, so this is a, a very typical example. So the entailment has to do with um, conjunction in this case. So the conjunction has to do with, um, no, no, that's not, that's not a good one, okay. So I can use I can use this one on the whiteboard. <clears throat> and we'll use um, P and Q and that implies P. Okay, here we go. So we have We have f here, you know, involving you know two variables. So we have f p q being p and q, and then we have g, and I can always put p and q into it, but it really ignores one of them. It just have p in it. Okay, so is that okay? How we define your p? Uh, I mean, the f and g as functions. F is you know the the one thing on the left hand side of the entailment, and then g is the one on the right hand side of the entailment. Is that okay? How many variables do we have? We got two variables. Okay. So with two variables, which are P and Q, how many rows do we have in this truth table? We have two independent Boolean variables, which means each one can be true or false. But since they are independent, how many rows do we have? Two to the power of two, which is four. Okay, so we got, you know, False, false, true, true for P. And then for Q, we have false, true, false, true. That, those are the four possible ways to combine P and Q, each one being true or false. Is that okay? So now we apply the functions, okay? So we look at P and Q and go like, okay, when P is false, Q is false, you know, P and Q is false, okay? You know, we know this truth table pretty well, and we can fill it in just like that. Is that okay? Then we look at P by itself, go like, okay, you know, it does not even depend on Q, we just copy the column for P, right? So we got zero, zero, one, one here. Is that okay? So on one side, you know, my so-called, you know, phi, you know, my phi one in this case, is really just the conjunction, I, got, I don't have anything else. So we have P and Q being phi one. My psi on the other side is just P itself, okay? So my question is, 
is P and Q semantically and temporally P. And by definition, if it is, then I have to say that this implies this is true all the time. Well, according to the truth table, is it true all the time? Okay, let's let's check it out. Yeah. Yes. False implies implies false is true. true. False implies false is true. and true. False implies true. true is true. Very good. And then we have true implies true is true. true. Oh, well, since you know all four rules, does <coughs> f function f implying you know, function g, then we do have semantic entanglement. So what is the big deal of, it, of uh, semantic entailment? Semantic entailment means it is meaningful. It makes sense. That's what it's saying. Okay, it is basically saying, okay, when you see this particular symbol, let me, let me go back to the notation here. When you see something like this, it's basically saying it makes sense to have this as the conclusion when you have these as given facts. That's what it's saying. It makes sense. The next one, you know, we are running out of time. We've got one minute left, but I can at least you know, talk about the overall meaning, of the, the, the overall um, rationale of this discussion. The next one is called semantic entailment. Semantic entailment has a different symbol. Semantic entailment uses exactly the same symbol that we have been using all along, which is the, in, the inference symbol. What, it will, what this really is saying is, can we syntactically derive uh, psi from having phi 1 all the way up to phi n using the syntactical system? Is it reachable? Can we syntactically do this? Okay. So once again, semantic entailment is basically saying, is it meaningful? Okay. Is the result you know, meaningful from you know, what we start off with? And that's according to the meaning of the logical operations that we have defined. Syntactic entailment is asking the question of, okay, given the syntactic transformations, which we know as inference rules, okay, given those things, can we syntactically derive, in this case, you know, psi from phi 1 all the, way to, all the way up to phi n? So one has to do with syntactical you know, issues. The other one has to do with meaningful <coughs> issues. We have completeness, okay? So soundness has to do with whether anything that can be derived is actually meaningful. If everything that you can derive syntactically is actually meaningful, then we have soundness, okay? Because all the derivations that you can mechanically do are actually sound. They reflect you know, reality, they reflect the actual meaning that is behind the logical operations. But it, does not it doesn't mean it is complete. In other words, there might be things that are meaningful, but your syntactical system cannot do it. Okay? So it, is, it, may, it can be incomplete. Complete, on the other hand, is the other way around. Okay? It's everything that is meaningful is also doable syntactically. That is the question. If it is the case, then it is complete. But once again, completeness itself does not, does not automatically imply soundness because um, you can have more stuff on the other side. There can be something that is not meaningful, but it can be derived. So it is only when we have soundness and completeness, then the logical system is useful. Because it means you know, everything that you can semantically, using the meaning derived, using you, you know, as, a, as a person to prove the theorem, can also be proved using a mechanical system. The computer can do exactly the same thing. And everything that the computer can do, you can do it as well. You might have to do it, take a little bit longer, but it is actually something that is meaningful to you. So that's the, that's the reason why we have to talk about soundness and completeness. Because you can make a, a propositional system, propositional logic system, that is totally useless, okay? Because it doesn't reflect anything in reality. And this is basically a sanity check to see whether the propositional logic system itself is actually useful or not. Okay. So we can come back and talk about this next Tuesday a little bit. Okay, but I do want you guys to read about this. 
the next few topics are you know normal forms and resolution because you know we are going to talk about how do we get uh, how do we not get bothered by the problems that we talked about a little bit earlier today, which is basically that syntactical rules can generate an infinite amount of meaningless well-formed formula. So can we actually use something that is useful that computer can actually use to prove theorems? That's the context of, of next Tuesday's lecture. All right.